right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our speaker today is Ch Chad Nelson from Nelson Law Office in Millbank, South Dakota, and he comes highly recommended from Professor Vickery. Um, he was in the USD Law School class of 2003, I learned, and prior to becoming a lawyer, um, Chad was a social worker and for seven years. Seven years and received his master's in uh, social work from the University of Nebraska. Uh, his practice is basically a general practice. Um, some areas of focus might include uh, civil litigation, criminal defense, but I'll let him give you a little bit more about um, his background and practice. And we'll turn the time over to him now for our law practice management section. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as she said, my name is Chad Nelson. I'm from Millbank. I'll give you a little bit of background, maybe more than you want, but it'll let you know who's talking to you. I grew up in Millbank, three hours north of here. Um, I had the privilege and uh, the experience of graduating from the University of South Dakota two different times, first in 1991. Uh, my background was in psychology and social work at that time. And then uh, again in 2003 from the law school. In between, as uh, indicated, I did go to the University of Nebraska at Omaha, got my master's in social work, worked in the mental health center in Watertown for seven years. It was a really good experience. I learned a lot, but one of the things that I did learn was I didn't want to do it seven more years. So I, in the fall of 2000, I went back to law school. Um, from that time then, I, after I graduated in 2003, I went back to Millbank, opened up an office, and I've been in private practice now for, uh, by myself, I guess, for a little bit over 10 years in private practice since 2003. My practice uh, is heavily criminal um, in Grant County, where Millbank is located. I have the public defender contract. I do half of the court appointments in Dual County, a neighboring county where Clear Lake is the county seat. But I also um, am a deputy state's attorney in Watertown, another neighboring county. So uh, I do a little bit of both in terms of criminal work. And I have a friend that will call me up when I'm traveling and he'll ask me, am I trying to put people in jail or keep them out on any given day? And it just depends on where I'm going. So. Um, so I do a lot of criminal work. My practice also involves um, family law, like a lot of small town practices do, uh, estate planning, wills and trusts, that type of thing, and a lot of real estate as well, purchase agreements um, and those sorts of things. So that's a little bit about me. I do want to ask, how many of you are set to graduate here just in a little bit? Is that, okay, that's awesome. Are you guys nervous, excited? A little bit of everything, okay. How many of you are thinking about going out on your own or practicing solo or in a small firm? Okay, well this talk hopefully will be geared to give you lots of things to think about and consider um, as you go do that and maybe especially if you're looking at going out on your own, that's the scariest of all. If you're going into a firm, you at least hopefully have somebody else with some experience. Um, so let's get started. And I think the first place that as new lawyers, all of us really need to start is the uh, section of the code that are the powers and duties of attorneys. That's uh, 1618. Um, but I don't think that's just for people who are just starting. I think that's for all of us. In fact, when I was getting ready for today, I looked in there and there's always something to refresh your memory, and uh, I just want to even just mention, you know, something that I think we all need to be reminded of or made aware of if we don't. For example, 16, 18, 17, an attorney's duty to represent the oppressed. It is the duty of an attorney and counselor at law never to reject, for any consideration, personal to himself, the cause of the defenseless or the oppressed. Um, I think in law school, it's easy to lose sight of that. I'm, you probably heard that when you very first started during your orientation, and now you've officially heard it at the end of your education as well. 
you will be in a unique position to help people. And especially, I think, maybe if you're in a solo or small practice, you will meet people from all walks of life. And you will meet people that really do need your help. Um, and as it indicates right in the powers and duties of attorneys, we all have that responsibility to assist them. I don't think most of us feel that as a responsibility or a duty that we are compelled to do. Most of us, I think, actually really feel like we want the opportunity to do that. And it is very nice to do that. And I think you all will find that to be your experience as well. So first piece of advice today, uh, take a look at that. And um, familiarize yourself with Title 16, uh, 18. There's just a lot of good information in there. And then more specifically, of course, are the South Dakota Rules of Professional Conduct. Does Dean, or Professor Vickery, he was Dean when I was here, uh, does he teach the legal profession? And I assume that the Rules of Professional Conduct are, okay. So I won't spend a lot of time about a lot of that, except I will talk about Rule 1.5, um, as you'll see in the outline. But again, just like uh, Title 16, I think the rules of professional conduct, very beneficial. Take the time, peruse them. If you can't sleep some night, pull them out and read until you fall asleep. Um, so we'll get to that. But then I want to talk about this whole, hopefully, talk tonight is a bit of a toolkit, so to speak, for you if you're opening your practice or you're going into practice within a small firm. Um, attachments. Pages one through four, and I don't know that I have them numbered super well for you, but after the uh, kind of the outline for the talk, then we have some, and it's like 001 if you have it on your computer. And that's the checklist for starting a law practice office. Um, it could be formatted slightly better. I apologize for that. But the material is really good, um, especially if you're thinking about starting your own practice. I guess what I would recommend, and actually frankly what I did when I started mine, get a great big three ring binder, subdivide it roughly with these subjects, and then as you gather information, you take notes, just slide everything in there. It's amazing how much there is to gather and how much time that takes, um, but it's well worth it, the organization. You know, for example, you get a couple quotes on copiers, slide them in there, and then use this checklist to help make sure that uh, you're covering all the bases, and I think that will be beneficial to you. And as you can see, it uh, covers a lot of the different areas that you want to think about if you're starting up your own office. It's actually reasonably comprehensive, and um, will get you thinking about everything. It may not have the answers, but it does get you asking the questions, which I think really is the important part. In addition to just talking generally about starting your own practice or your firm, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about fee agreements for a bit. Probably, hopefully, it's the most dry part of what you're going to hear today. Uh, but we'll get that done with first then. And uh, there should have been an assignment today that you would have received. Part of that is, I don't know if you blame me or thank me, but my unorganization. So there actually won't be one. I don't know if you know that. but. Uh, you can either blame me or credit me. Either way, I'm not sure which it is, but I don't think there will be. Um, rule 1.5 of the Rules of Professional Conduct is the area that covers fee agreements. Um, and in the outline that you were given, I really have 1.5 in its entirety. Um, I know you don't really need me to read the rule to you, but I do want to touch briefly on it. And that is, you know, to start, it starts out basically... Um, the scope of the representation and the basis or rate of the fee and the expense for which the client will be responsible shall be communicated to the client, preferably in writing, before or within a reasonable time after commencing the representation, except where you maybe have a regular client that you've worked with and then you still need to at some point communicate. Basically, that simply says try to have something written, either an engagement letter or a fee agreement. We'll go through examples of both. Um, the idea is that when you get it in writing, communicate it to the client, your bases are covered, and there's no question about whether or not they should have understood 
what the arrangement is. Um, and as I indicated, there's two ways to do that. You can have a written fee agreement or you can have an engagement letter. Uh, either one of them work and those are covered in the attachments on pages 7 and 8 is the contract for legal services that is hourly. Um, so you can use that so you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you don't have one where you're going. And I just want to point out the highlights and that is that obviously it indicates your hourly rate and then an hourly rate for anybody else that might be working in your office, whether it's an, another associate or it's a paralegal, it may not be the same hourly rate. So you get that indicated in there. And then you want to cover and let them know that there may be expenses that come out of, uh, you know, that go into their bill, whether that's copy costs or uh, filing fees or, or whatever else it may be, you let them know ahead of time. And then on page seven of the attachments in the, uh, third paragraph down in the scope of services, it also addresses the issue of a retainer. And we'll talk a little specifically about that. Um, I'll probably even say this later on, but you just need to know as you go out and start your career, retainers are really, really good <laughs> um, to get a commitment from the client uh, financially, I think actually makes them more cooperative. I think they communicate better. It also really does help that you ensure that you're getting paid. And then you want to address in your uh, contract how that works. And you can see in the example that we provided, this one's a $5,000 security retainer. A security retainer would be if, if they don't pay within a certain amount of time and you can access that to make sure that you do get paid. And that's just set forward. And then you want to explain what happens, you know, when do you access the retainer? Is it when the bill is sent out, is it a certain number of days after you build them? I mean, those are decisions you get to make, but those are the things that you put uh, in there. And then the last paragraph in there, I think actually is very important. And it is further agreed that the undersigned agrees to cooperate with the law firm in all the matters requested. Without cooperation from your client, uh, it's really hard for you to do the work that you need to do, especially at the level and the kind of the quality that needs to be done and you do need them to buy into it and not be passive. So um, you have a rough example of a contract for legal services for an hourly fee that you can take with you. Obviously, you can modify it to suit your own needs. Uh, please do, but it's just to kind of get you started. And then we have contingency fee agreements, and uh, those are most commonly used in personal injury cases, for example, uh, sometimes probates. It's changing a little bit with probates, however you should know. I don't know that the rule has formally changed, but there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that um, you cannot really necessarily easily defend just a straight percentage on a probate, you know, as you probate in the state. Um, you know, there are times maybe a an estate can be extremely large. Maybe it's in the millions of dollars and to justify two or three percent for something that maybe is really straightforward is just getting more difficult to do. So I think the preference is leaning more toward um, hourly rate on probates, but it is an example where contingency fee agreements are used. And uh, that's shown in attachment pages 9, 10, and 11. And rule 1.5 sub C of the rules of professional conduct cover that as well. And uh, I'm going to highlight part of that. And it says a contingent fee agreement shall be in writing, signed by the client, and shall state the method by which the fee is to be determined. And probably the biggest, most important component in there is shall be signed by the client. Uh, again, at that point, you have everything spelled out in the agreement. When they've signed, they've basically agreed and signed on. So don't forget to get them signed and not just tucked in the file somewhere. And then we have a blended or hybrid fee agreement that clearly is a combination of both of them. Uh, there may be some parts of the work that you charge hourly and then there may, maybe you take a percentage. Um, there are certain things, I'm sure that you've discussed this with uh, 
Professor Vickery, that you cannot take on contingency. You cannot make the outcome of a criminal case, you know, a contingent fee based on the outcome of a criminal case. Uh, for example, you also cannot do that in family law, for example, when it comes to uh, the outcome with custody or property settlement, that type of thing. Uh, those need to be hourly rates only. But Rule 1.5 does not specifically address the hybrid or the blended fee agreement. Uh, but I think the safest course of action is, again, to make sure that that is in writing, signed by the client. Yes? Uh, when you say signed by the client, do electronic signatures count? Like can PDF signature on electronic signature? Uh, the client doesn't want to amend when they sign electronic. So the question is, uh, can they sign electronically and is that a valid signature? Yes. I am no expert in that. I will tell you, though, that that is more and more being used, and my short answer is yes. I think the concern would be the threshold you want to meet is, can you be reassured that that's your client's signature? Um, in fact, well, to get off that a little bit, I had I filed an electronic signature this morning in criminal court. I pled a client by power of attorney, and the judge canvassed me, are you sure that this is your client's signature? Well, I didn't watch her sign it, it was done electronically, but I advised her of all of her rights, we discussed the case, her signing that or that signature is consistent with the agreement that she and I struck on the phone. Um, you can have it witnessed, so you'd have a witness, I think, to verify it or have it notarized. So I do think that they work, and I think more and more all the time as technology moves in that direction. So I guess Personally, I would not be afraid to use them. Um, and then, okay, so we talked a little bit about the, the hourly fee agreement or the contract. Engagement letters are a viable, useful option as well. And there's some nice things about that. And, of course, the engagement letter is considered the key to the attorney-client relationship. And it is the contract that, along with the rules of professional conduct, to govern your relationship with your client. So it is your opportunity to establish the ground rules for that relationship. Um, you know, you have a chance to clear up any ambiguities before they ever start. And so it is really worth your while to take some time on that and to draft that in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, because it does help avoid disputes with clients, and if the conflict would arise with them, that document is kind of what you go to to settle the dispute, and what that says will probably carry the day. And if there's ambiguities in there because you drafted it, um, they would count basically against you. So obviously you want to do the best job that you can. So you know that really means just being careful to expressly identify who it is that you represent and who it is, maybe just as importantly, that you do not represent. You know, an example that comes to my mind is maybe you're doing some criminal defense. You have a 19-year-old that's charged with a crime. You're going to represent the 19-year-old. Um, but the 19-year-old has a parent paying for the services. Well, who's your client? Who are you going to answer to ultimately? The person writing the check or the person who's, you know, in front of the judge? Um, so it's very clear to get that made uh, established then. I'm going to tell you that I believe that you're representing a 19-year-old and that's where your duty lies. Uh, and you need to probably have that discussion and have that in writing with the parent who may have some expectations about how the case goes since they are writing the check. But again, talking about that on the front end, I think can take care of a lot of problems. So be very specific about what it is that you're doing that you're being retained for. Uh, describe the expectations in a fee agreement that are established that your client should have. Um, my advice with the expectations component is um, make them task-oriented, not outcome-oriented, because uh, you can absolutely lay out the tasks that you're going to perform, the order in which you're going to perform them, but especially if somebody else has control over the outcome, like a judge or a planning and zoning committee or whatever, you're not going to guarantee a result. You're going to tell them what you're going to do to get them 
in a position to have the best result possible. Obviously, you cannot guarantee the outcome. So, and also then, take the opportunity with an engagement letter to establish the expectations you have for your client so you know what they, they know what they need to do. One piece of advice or thought is to make sure that in almost all of those agreements as you establish client expectation is that they will be in regular communication with you. There's no harder client to do work for than the absent client. They do need to be kept apprised of uh, developments. They need to have input. And if you cannot get a hold of them or you're not getting feedback, it's almost impossible to do the work that you need to do for them. And then detail the payment for services and the timing of payment. Of payment. We've just talked about all the work that you're going to do. This is the part then that benefits you and that's kind of exciting to get paid for your efforts and it helps you keep your doors open. So you avoid probably the number one dispute between clients and attorneys and that really is billing if you write a good engagement letter and get those issues made clear from the beginning. And as I had said, make sure that the hourly fee is clear for the attorney and for the paralegal. Obviously that won't be the same. And then put in there so that they know that there are expenses and disbursements if there's advances that are charged against a retainer, for example. Bottom line is, just be very clear about all of that. Um, and as you go forward, how many of you think you might practice some form of family law, at least in the beginning? Yeah. I, I have developed a little truism of my own. I've tested this with colleagues. It does seem to be true, especially in the area of family law. And uh, I mean this respectfully. But it does seem like the most demanding clients in terms of expectations, uh, their patience or lack of everything, are also the least likely to pay you. So they expect the most out of you, maybe the least out of themselves. It does seem to be a pattern. And again, if you have a good engagement letter or fee agreement, I think you can head off a lot of potential conflicts from the beginning. And that's what you want to do. And also that's why it's so important to have the retainers right away in case they would be reluctant to pay you. And in the engagement letter, obviously pay special attention to describing retainer rules. First of all, you want to be sure to avoid any misunderstanding that the retainer is actually a, a flat fee. If somebody's giving you $2,000 to get a divorce started, it is just that to get the divorce started. It's not to see it through uh, discovery, and, you know, like interrogatories, depositions, and then all the way through to trial, you know, after mediation and negotiation, uh, $2,000 just wouldn't do it. So make sure that they know that, that you'll bill against it, and when that's gone, there needs to be more. Um, one thing that you'll find when you, yes? Sorry, um, can you explain what type of case you take a retainer for versus a security retainer? Sure. Um, well, you're... The question is, what type of case would you take a retainer for versus a security retainer? Um, I, there's no bright line on that. These are just different options that are available to you. Um, I will tell you, I am just not very good at taking security retainers, and that's just because I don't think about it enough. I mean, it's just that simple sometimes. Um, but I do believe, particularly in criminal law and family law, the retainers really are beneficial to the lawyer. Um, and to use them. You know, for all of you that raised your hand, and there were quite a number of you that you're going to be practicing family law, there probably will not go a week that goes by that somebody won't ask you, I'm thinking about getting divorced, how much is it going to cost? Well, you cannot answer that question. It's impossible. Um, you can tell them how much you charge. You can tell them how much certain things cost. But you can't give them the total cost because it really depends on them. Um, and I kind of let them know that at the beginning so that, again, the expectation is it's going to depend a lot on the behavior of the parties. If they obviously are agreeable and can uh, reach an agreement on property, kids, whatever it is, it'll be relatively inexpensive as far as legal fees go. But if they are the kind of people that are going to fight, they're 
is no practical limit to how much they could end up spending in a divorce. Um, I did have a case where the two parties wanted to spend hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars fighting over a matchbox car, and it wasn't a collector's car, it was a 99 cent car. And if the attorneys would have been willing, we would have fought about that for a couple weeks probably. So you have to, again, gear clients' expectations, I think. That's really helpful to setting the, the tone and the course of the case as you undertake it. And then whether it's a security retainer or a general retainer, set forth the replenishment requirements. You know, when is that retainer required to be brought back to the original amount and under what conditions? So for example, you take a $2,000 retainer, uh, do they need to get that back up to $2,000 once they hit $500? You set, you set that. You may even negotiate uh, with the client, um, but keep that in there. And then of course, accessing the retainer. Let them know when that retainer is going to get billed, when that money will be taken out of your trust account. When the bill is issued, 10 days after that it's been sent to the client, uh, you just have to make those decisions based on how your office functions, but make it clear whatever it is that you do. Now in the outline that was, I think, sent to you, now this is where we have the uh, assignment that you're not going to have, so we'll skip that. Um, but what I do want to talk about next now is really getting yourself established as new lawyers. Um, and getting your office started and getting established, and that'll probably be the major focus of the rest of what I have to say today. So let's talk about networking first. And I'm going to start with a quote from Bob Morris. Have any of you met Bob? He's an attorney out at Belfouche. He, for the past several years, has been the person here instead of me, but um, you really couldn't be in South Dakota and get farther away from uh, Vermillion. So I'm filling in today. I also, just so you know, and borrowing heavily from his materials, which he prepared very well. So any defect is mine in presentation, not his in terms of the materials presented. But so his quote, which I just think is fun, it is not who you know, it is who you know, what you know, and letting who you know, what you know. Well, you can know everything that you need to know, but you need to make sure other people know that so that they will go to you. It's basically what I think Mr. Morris is trying to say. So just in general, try to be seen and heard. You have to make people aware that you're around. Uh, don't be shy. And if you are, spend time with people who are not. I'm on the reserved side. I'm not super gregarious in social situations, but I have friends who do not have that problem. And I meet a lot of people through them. So I actually follow that advice. Get involved in the community that you're in. Um, you can have solo practices, obviously, in big cities and in small towns. So some of this advice, you know, maybe a little bit more specific. The lens that I think of these things through is tends to be small town, since I'm in Millbank. But I think it applies no matter what. But you know, join local organizations. Pursue activities that you enjoy and will get you some visibility. Um, when I went back to Millbank, I really, really liked to golf. And so it's just a great excuse to join a league. Um, I have regular playing partners that we, there's one day a week that we all play and uh, every single one of them are, have been clients of mine throughout the year, throughout the years. So think of how you can sort of blend your interests and ability, you know, opportunities and your ability to network. Uh, I also like to hunt, so obviously I've joined, you know, Pheasants Forever and Ducks Unlimited and they have the banquets and you get to meet people. Not everybody has those interests, obviously, but find yours and, uh, and, and do those. Volunteer for youth activities. I think that's, that's good advice. It's a little bit dangerous. Uh, you know, I can ref sometimes some basketball for some kids. You get to meet a lot of the parents. Um, if you're doing something like refing, sometimes that could almost invite negative interaction, so give that a little thought, depending if they like the job that you've done or not, but, but it's an opportunity. Show up at governmental meetings, city council, county commissioners. Make sure that the, you know, the 
council members, the commissioners know who you are. Introduce yourself before or after the meetings. They really will be happy to meet you. They want to know that you are there as a resource. Um, and they'll take note and appreciate that you've done that. Attend Cracker Barrel sessions. And then it says, you know, of course, contribute time and money. As you're just starting out, you may not be so much on the money side, but that's fine. As long as people, you know, know that you're there. Get involved in the local legal community. Attend local bar association meetings. Are any of you going to really small towns, Millbank size or smaller, you know, 4,000 or less when you open up? A couple of you? Uh, how big? 830. 830? Okay, that's pretty small. And? Okay. So you probably are not going to have local bar association meetings. Um, no link doesn't either. We have six attorneys there. But like Watertown does, you know, a neighboring community. And so I'll go over to the Watertown's Bar Association and, and, and network that way. Um, and if they have local bar association meetings, volunteer, get yourself involved. And if you can't do that, then get involved in the state bar activities and associations. I personally believe that is really important. How many of you have gone to the state bar as students? About half. Um, I think it, they're very actually enjoyable few days, informative, and really, really a good opportunity for networking. So those of you who have been there, you know that they have the hospitality suites. I mean, there can't be a more relaxed place to meet people. CLEs, again, great places to go to meet people. Um, you know, South Dakota does not require continuing legal education, but I think that we have one of the highest rates of participation even though we're not required. And that's partly because the networking is so good in our state. And we do have a small bar, and everybody is very friendly to each other. So take advantage of that, basically, is what I want to say. It says volunteer, you know, to present the CLE. I haven't done that, but I will sign up and serve on a committee. Um, presenting one probably is not going to be what I'm going to do. Consider seeking a position on the Young Lawyers Board or as a bar commissioner. Uh, that is a really good way to get involved, and you'll meet the, uh, the officers of the bar um, very fast that way. And I actually strongly recommend that. And as you go out and practice, build relationships with other lawyers. I think that is probably most important. And I've asked you to raise your hands a lot, but how many people are going to practice in South Dakota? Most of you? Okay. Well, I always just smile because anytime two lawyers in South Dakota get together, it's pretty much a school reunion. Um, you may be 30 years apart from when you came here, but uh, almost all of us have gone through these halls. And I think a huge advantage of going to school in South Dakota, as you all obviously have, is as soon as you are admitted to the bar and start practicing, you're going to know how many are in your class, 60, 70? you'll know almost that many other lawyers that are admitted to the bar in South Dakota. And that is such an advantage. Because as we're talking about young lawyers inexperienced and we're trying to figure out what we need to do with a given case or how do we approach something and you want to talk to people, um, you're already networked in with each other. And that, I think, is just really, really valuable. And that alone is a great reason to uh, attend school here, in my opinion. Another really helpful hint as you get established is have a mentor. Um, have somebody who does have experience that you can pick up the phone, give them a call, and talk to them and bounce ideas off of them. You know, there's some helpful hints to do that. Obviously, don't be viewed as a competitor. And unless I think you do something to create that impression, I don't think you'll be perceived that way. Um, we have a really uh, collegial bar, very cooperative sense of community. And my experience, as I'm sure you've heard other guest lecturers say throughout the three years you've been here, is I don't think anybody gets turned down if you call somebody up and ask for advice, a thought, some guidance. Our bar, I think, is exceptional that way. Uh, but, you know, to help develop that network and mentors, refer clients to other lawyers. And especially if there's something 
that you're not going to do for a client. I have a very general practice. There are certain things that I don't do, uh, certain things I'm not comfortable doing. I don't, for example, do bankruptcies. So I refer them to colleagues, other lawyers. And I, I ask the re person I'm referring to tell the other lawyer who sent them. Well, I do it for two reasons. One, I really do want them to know that I'm sending them the business and they know where that business comes from. But the other is if they have any questions about that person, they can give me a call. So it helps facilitate the communication. And as you get started, let other lawyers know what you want to have as your primary practice areas. Maybe you don't want family law to be an emphasis. Maybe you want to be exclusively a criminal lawyer. Uh, let the other people know that so that as they are making referrals, they will have you in mind. Um, and be a resource for other lawyers as you can, and you will be able to. Have lunch or breakfast with other lawyers just to network. And then, of course, the golden rule, one of the things that you learn in kindergarten, right? Treat others like you wish to be treated. Give more than you take. I think when you do that, uh, you gain the respect and the trust of the other attorneys, and they just return the favor. And you'll end up with having a great sense of community, and you'll be familiar with a lot of other attorneys in the state. So what is next will be some tips from other attorneys practicing in South Dakota that have belonged to the uh, South Dakota Solo and Small Practice Committee. And as we do this and I go through some of these, I'm going to highlight them. I'm not going to just read all of them to you. But it's important to know where they're from because I think it affects the advice that they give you. And I'll kind of hit on that. But Jamie Damon from Peer basically says he got some advice when he started. And that was to ask two questions of every client. The first is, who else have you talked to about this issue that brings you here? And the second is, what did they tell you? That, those really are good questions. And I have a form here that I'll, I, don't, I didn't make copies, but I'll just sort of pass it around for you to look at. I have an initial client intake form. And I try to kind of get at that. When people come in as prospective clients, um, I have them fill out some paperwork. And a couple of the questions are, you know, who referred you and have you talked to other attorneys about this? And I don't know that it's easy to pass around, but you can just take a look at it. Move it. But ask those questions. It'll help you know how to interview them. Um, and if they tell you, give you some advice with another client, or I'm sorry, another lawyer says, you know, well, he said I didn't have a good case, or she said that this was a really great case, but I can't handle it. You'll get a lot of feedback that will help in your determination. Um, and then his quote here in terms of doing that is, uh, his philosophy has always been that if he's going to work for free, he'll go home and vacuum and not subject himself to malpractice. And well, I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, pro bono is expected of all of us once we're practicing. And even if it wasn't, again, it's something just that I think we all want to do and to help people. But what we want to do is decide who we do pro bono work for, not just because we have a client who won't pay us and we end up doing it. So it is nice to control that. Bill Sims from Sioux Falls, his advice as a committee member to all of you and to me is first, control your expenses. Even a one-person firm like I have, it is amazing how quickly expenses mount and how difficult it is to keep them low. But keep in mind, attempt to control your expenses to the extent that you can. Just be mindful, I think. And then case selection is everything. And I think that's easier said than done. You're starting out, you have clients come in, prospective clients, they want help. You want to find a way to help them. But I will tell you this, trust your gut instinct. If you have red flags, uh, listen to that and don't take them. I mean, if you don't believe in the case, for example, you may just never really do a good job. Um, in the 13 years that I've been practicing, I've been fired, well, once when I had a court appointment, I, I was fired. I had represented parents in an abuse and neglect case. Um, they were the worst parents that I'd ever worked with. 
And I think that, that came across my attitude that, that I felt that way. And they fired me, and it was a good thing because they ended up with somebody who could believe more in what they were doing. Um, I try not to let that happen. It did in that case, but it was a good thing that, that they recognized it and found a better fit. Um, so, and Bob Peasall from Flanders, South Dakota, submitted a top 10 for all of you to think about. Number 10, do not be afraid of new technology, but test it on weekends first. And I do want to talk a little bit about technology later on, because if you're, especially if you're in a small practice, you're the one making that decision. You know, if you go to a big firm, the technology is going to be in place for you, and all you have to do is learn your part of it. If you're running the show, you're going to have to decide what technology you want, what technology you need, and what technology you feel like you can pay for. Number nine, feel free to ask other lawyers for help, but don't ask the ones that you're actually opposing. Um, I do think that's good advice. Number eight, put everything that matters in a letter to your client. We've talked a little bit about that already. You probably cannot document too much. When in doubt, write it down. I really do think that's good advice. Number seven, in engagement letters are good. Termination letters are also very good. Let your clients know when you're done. I'm just going to confess I'm not very good at that. I prepare for something like this and it reminds me I need to get better. It's not always clear when your work is done. And frankly, you don't necessarily want to give them the idea that it's completely done because you want them to come back. Um, but from a liability standpoint, don't forget about termination letters so that they aren't expecting you to do something and you're thinking that you're done. That is actually really good advice. Number six, get on mailing lists like the Solo Network. Um, He's retired now, but Professor Barron had a, a family law kind of list. Do you guys still have the equivalent of that? Okay, yeah. But that was available to, I think, all of us for a while at least. Yeah. So those are very helpful. Um, remember that humor has its place in the courtroom, but obviously be careful when you use it. Make sure it's appropriate. Take vacations, you have to live a balanced life. You really can burn out, especially when you are your own boss and you're the one that has to get this done. Number three, uh, don't be afraid to take bono, pro bono cases. Just make sure you can afford it. Bob P. Saul's number two piece of advice, don't be afraid to reject a case if you know you won't get paid or you really cannot stand the potential client. Kind of talked about that already, but very true. And then his number one piece of advice, Bring donuts to the clerk of court's office anytime you visit a county for the first time. The clerk of courts are the gatekeepers and the key masters, basically. You really do want to be on good terms with the clerks. Um, and then, you know, there's more advice from other people. Katie Wentworth Johnson from Beersford says, don't be afraid to ask for a good retainer fee up front. Even if you're scared that you might not get it or the work, you know, you really need it. Because nine times out of ten, if you don't get a good retainer, you don't get paid. And then you're trying to collect on the back end, and at that point, the client has no incentive to pay you. So on the front end is just so much better. Um, Tom Keller from Sioux Falls, a very good, well-respected attorney. He His advice is to make sure that you advertise. And I think this is where it makes a big difference where you practice. Um, if you practice in Sioux Falls, Rapid City, Pier, maybe even Brookings, Watertown, I would agree with him. Um, I think if you live in a town or a community the size of Millbank or smaller, I'm not so sure that I agree there. I can speak for Millbank. Um, I think when people want to call up an attorney or hire an attorney, uh, the only reason that they go to the phone book is to look up the number of the person they already have in mind. I don't think they're scrolling through the yellow pages and then making their decision on the ad. I just do not believe that. Um, in that form I'm passing through that I used, my intake form, um, I used that and I would pay attention to how people got to me in yellow pages, I think is an option on there. I think in like five years I had one person check that and they were wrong because I wasn't in the yellow pages. So I just don't think that, you know, if you're in Sioux Falls, I know that, you know, the back of the, co the phone book goes for six figures, you know, and there's always personal injury lawyers on the back of the phone book. Um, and they say, they swear up and down that that gives them all sorts of business. I just don't think the same thing holds true in a smaller community. 
is really is network based. If they don't know you in the first place, they probably aren't going to talk to you. They're going to go to somebody that they know, I guess is what I'm saying. So I think that's good advice. Amy Bartling from Gregory, South Dakota. She also advises to be very, very friendly to clerks and their assistants um, and court reporters. They, you know, the clerks of court and the court reporters are people that you need. Um, and they are very willing to help you if they have a good relationship with you. And there's lots of ways that they can help you. South Dakota has gone largely to electronic filing now. And it's been quite a transition. You know, there are many of us who are used to just paper filing. And to be on good terms with clerks who are patient to help us through that process and explain it or maybe accept things that they wouldn't have to but because they weren't done properly is very helpful. Um, really short story. Last week, Friday afternoon, I walked up to the clerk's office and nobody else was in there. The clerk was sitting there looking very despondent. And I said, how are you? And she said, I do not like, and then she rattled off the name of another attorney. Well, she just had had a negative phone converse, you know, interaction with that person. Um, and he's just not going to probably get the help that he needs later on. I don't know. So be very kind to them is what I'm saying. And the court reporters as well. Uh, I don't know. Am I talking too fast today? They get after me for talking too fast all the time. <laughs> so I try to slow down. Um, but they're very helpful too. You know, you may need transcripts from them. Um, lot, you know, court schedules. If you uh, get along well with court reporters, you will be well served. And then some more advice from Amy Bartley. Obviously, if you have an office assistant, all of you will right away or eventually treat them well. It's the same principle. Uh, they will help a lot more when they're motivated. And so there's just lots of advice you can get from people who've been out there doing it. They're very willing to give that advice. Ask them their thoughts, they will share them. There are tons of resources out there on the internet, at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, to help get you started. If you're starting your own firm and you want to think about it, um, a few of them are in Section 7 of the outline, Section 8, some specific things. I'll just kind of pass this book around, How to Start a Solo Law Practice, just to give you an idea of things that are out there. Um, I actually have some better books, but I loaned them out and never got them back because they are good books. So read them. You know, you'll find something useful in all of them. Not everything in every book will apply, obviously, uh, but use them. And now I'm going beyond what you received on your email, but I do want to provide some additional thoughts and ideas for you as you start out. And I just want to emphasize again, I actually really think it's important when people come in, even if they ultimately aren't your client, um, but when people come in for a consult, track the referral information. How did they get to you? Whether you have a form that does that, like I try to do, or ask them, and keep a bit of a record. Um, it can give you a lot of information. You can know who to thank, maybe who you need to uh, network with more to develop as a referent, and it can help shape your practice a little bit too. Uh, you know, are you getting, you know, physician referrals for personal injury cases or chiropractors? That's information that I think is only helpful to you if you take the time to track it. And if you're starting up your own practice or, you know, with somebody or you're responsible for some of your own overhead, find the cheapest, least expensive, but still, you know, obviously presentable resources that you can. As far as research resources, you know, one thing that I loved when I was in your seat is you have just unlimited access both to Lexis and Westlaw, don't you? I mean, you can't have more access than you guys have right now. But I'm assuming for all of you that graduate, that's going to end quickly. And then you have to figure out what you're going to do. Well, when you figure out what you're going to do, um, think about what you need the most. I've thought about that, like for me in my practice, First and foremost, I need South Dakota Supreme Court cases. I need South Dakota codified law. 
which I can get off the internet for free. I do have a set because I am old enough. I still like to follow the paper, but off the internet, United States Supreme Court and Eighth Circuit. It's not very often I need more than that. So gear your research according to what you think your the majority of your needs are going to be. Um, check the county that you're practicing in. Each county that has a courthouse is required to keep a law library of sorts. Some of them have found that it's just easier to give the attorneys access to online legal resources like Lexis. Um, I do have access to Lexis through Grant County, which is very helpful. Dakota Disk. Have you guys been exposed to Dakota Disk? The South Dakota Bar um, is responsible for putting that out. It's updated every year on a disk, obviously. Really, really helpful. And for as much information as you get, it is not very expensive. So look into that. And then I'm sure that you guys know more about this than I do, but just Google everything. It's amazing to me how you can just type something in and find your answers. So that's as far as resources go. And in terms of, you know, especially if you're starting your own office, you know, you need, you need pleadings, you need forms for everything. Um, don't reinvent the wheel unless you have to. Make it as easy on, on yourself as you can. Um, one set of books that I think is so helpful are the Amateur Legal Forms. Um, when I started out, I bought a set off of eBay, and it was not even a complete set, but it was super cheap, and it had most of what I needed. Um, and I probably use this set every single week. Um, so I'm just going to pass this around, and I just, with the uh, post-it note, and this was actually an accident that I found it right away, but this is the you know fee agreements, um, the other examples that you can use, other than what was in the outline. Um, Having something like that or knowing somebody who has that and will let you use it is really, really helpful. So Amjur Legal Forms, keep that in mind if your firm that you go to does not already have it. And if you are practicing by yourself, start and keep a form bank on your computer. When pleadings come in from opposing attorneys, scan it in and keep that form. And you'll find some that you like better than others and then you can develop your own off of those. Um, and if you really need something, ask another lawyer. They will give it to you. I have never actually had to have a client who is in custody waive a 15-day rule for preliminary hearing until last week, so I've never done that. Um, called another lawyer, and I had a form within five minutes, and so I didn't have. To, I haven't had to modify it a bit, but um, just really, really helpful. If you're furnishing your own office. You obviously need to present a certain image, but you don't necessarily need to uh, spend $20,000 doing it. Um, you know, Believe it or not, I think keep your eye open for estate sales from lawyers who have passed away. There's a lot of times that they have things to get rid of and nobody to take them. Take advantage of that. Or other businesses that are cl closing, you can get some pretty inexpensive office furniture, some decorations. And if you're heading in small towns, Main Street properties these days are uh, fairly inexpensive, and it's a great location for lawyers. So keep that in mind. And if you're starting your own office, invest in really good office personnel. Um, you may or you may not hire somebody right away. If you go out as soon as you pass the bar and hang out your shingle, um, I suppose it depends on what you can afford. But you will have somebody sooner or later and get the best person that you can. And when I say that, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, credentials. Uh, when I had an opening this summer in Millbank, I didn't have any office trained or paralegals apply, which was fine. I didn't expect that. But what I looked for were just personality traits and characteristics. Um, they can learn the stuff they need to learn if they have the right personality to fit in your office. Keep in mind that that's the first person that people either hear on the phone when they call in or that they see when they walk in. And so they're your ambassador and your liaison, and you just want to make sure that you have somebody that does those jobs well. Uh, you will not regret finding a good person. And when you do, 
pay that person enough to make sure that they stay. Um, paying them more than what they can get in other jobs in town is not a bad thing. In the end, I believe it's going to save you money. And if you're in a small or solo firm, you probably don't have the luxury of offering full benefits. And you might be competing against potential employers that do. I think one thing that you can do that offsets that a little bit is let them know that you can offer them, actually, instead of just a job, you can offer, offer them career opportunities. Um, somebody comes in, maybe they start out as the receptionist, but in the course of doing that, they're going to learn the ins and outs of how to handle probate files. Um, and if that appeals to them, uh, you, you might be able to keep that person for the next 20 years, 25 years. And so that they have a chance to really learn and develop some expertise as opposed to uh, just kind of rote responsibilities. Um, another piece of advice is cross-train everybody that's in your office. You never know when somebody's not going to be there. If you have only one person that knows how to handle billing, and at the first of the month they give two weeks notice and you need bills out by the end of the month, you don't want to scramble to try to figure out what they've been doing for the past five years because nobody else bothered to make it to learn how to do that. And as you're starting out, you of course have to figure out how to make things work financially. Um, you know, you've already heard plenty of advice about don't work for free and obtain the retainers, and that is really good advice, of course. But think outside the box a little bit. In most counties still in South Dakota, state's attorney's positions are part-time. Uh, work in an office like that. Part-time, have your practice part-time. You have the steady income from the state's attorney's office to help offset slow months or those months where you're starting. Uh, most of the time you are also are offered benefits. So something like that is very helpful. City attorney positions. Um, I'm the city attorney for three municipalities. Corona, I don't know if anybody's heard of that little town, or, okay, Twin Brooks, even smaller. Well, I'm their city attorney. They don't necessarily uh, keep me busy, but it's the more that you're out there and spread out, the more places you have to earn money from, the better off you'll do. So keep, you know, things like that in mind. And then look for compatible businesses that you don't have to just practice law in, a, in the most strict sense. Um, Real estate fits really, really well with the legal profession. Um, you know, work with the title company, whether you're doing uh, abstract opinion, title opinions, that type of thing, uh, buy into the company. But try to find ways then that you can diversify a little bit, spread out your income revenue, and then you're not so dependent on, uh, did you get the clients that month? Did you get the work done? And did you collect from them? It takes a little bit of pressure off that way. Another piece of advice, uh, when you're practicing on your own or in a small firm, be your own line of credit as soon as you can. When you start out, you may have to borrow money to get started. Cash flow presumably won't be what you would like it to be ultimately. And so maybe there's a month or two where you have to go access a line of credit, borrow some money to pay your receptionist, pay rent, whatever that is. And that's fine to start out, but as soon as you can, uh, keep enough money in your operating account that you do not need to use the bank for that. Law office technology. You know, if you're starting your own office, the bad news is you have to figure that out, but the good news is you can make it however you want. Obviously with technology, computer programs, software, it's rapidly changing. The costs vary. I will tell you that I believe that you get what you pay for. And really you have, in terms of law office management software, you have two main choices. You have the software that you buy, and then you can buy more of a service, um, kind of a cloud-based. I'm going to, I've had both, and I'm going to tell you right now, I think the cloud-based is what I really believe works the best. Subscription-based, you only pay for users that you have, so you can pay according to your need. The updates are automatic um, and often. I use my case. I don't know if any of you have even heard of that, but um, it, it is cloud-based. Super uh, user intuitive. It's comprehensive, integrative. Um, 
covers basically everything that I need to. I keep track of my time, as does anybody else that puts any time in. Keeps track of billing, client information. They actually have a portal that they can e um, access to their email so that they can keep abreast of well, where their retainer is at, for example, um, if any paperwork's been filed for them. So find something that works for you and that you think fits your office. And there's a lot of choices out there. Bank accounts, for any of you that are in the practice, you're probably going to have three accounts. Your personal bank account, your operating account for your business, you know, your office account, and then your trust account. If you can, and I don't think I'm the only person that thinks this, put them in three separate banks. Um, Professor Vickery probably talked about trust accounts, right? And if anything happens wrong with that, you either have to mandatorily report yourself or the bank reports you to the bar. And then there's a lot, you get a letter and you have to explain everything. Um, you don't want that, I'm just telling you. And at least if you have three separate accounts, the bank is going to make a mistake and put what should go into a trust account into your personal account or your operating account. And they do make mistakes. Um, I've had banks put money in a wrong account, didn't have anything to do with a trust account. It was actually personal accounts, but they do occasionally, but not if they're in three separate banks. So if you have that option, keep it in mind. Plus, you make sure that you grab the right check for the right bank instead of, you know, if there's two checks for the same bank. I just think it's easier to keep track of. Um, helps. You have to explain less to the, to the bar. And if you're going out on your own or if you're starting with somebody else, you have to decide what sort of entity you want to become. How do you want to practice? And I believe that the short answer in terms of should I form an entity is just simply yes. I think that you would be crazy not to. Um, those are covered in the code. You can start a professional corporation, a professional limited liability company. Um, you can choose what suits you. I have a professional corporation, but the code just sets everything out. Just review that. Um, and the reasons why I think that it's just so important to do is it just compartmentalizes any potential liability. If you incur any liability and you are, for example, just a sole proprietor and you don't have any sort of uh, compartmentalization uh, and you get sued, you don't want anybody to make an argument that they should get into your personal assets as well as your professional. Uh, it just acts like a baffle system. You know, I conceptualize, you know, like on these big ocean liners, they have baffle systems in case one part takes on water, the other part's kind of protected. Well, that's what these do. And then as you, uh, like if you buy a building, maybe you start that in an LLC, and then you can, one entity can rent from another, and I think there's some, maybe some tax advantages that way. Just things to keep in mind. Um, it's really inexpensive insurance, honestly, is how I look at it. Because you get that compartmentalization for liability, and it's with you for as long as you continue to use the entity. I just think it's just very, very helpful. And of course, as you start out, you have to figure out how much an hour do I charge? And that's going to depend on several factors. One, where you practice. There will be a going rate uh, with some variation, wherever it is that you practice. Obviously, I think Sioux Falls, the going rate is much higher than it is, like in Millbank, for example. Um, but that's going to be a determination. Um, what it is that you practice. Um, in my area, I probably I charge more per hour for probates than I do for criminal work, but that's sort of the nature of, also to an extent, uh, clients' ability to pay. And then ultimately your ex your experience. As more experience you get, the more you're going to be confident in what you do, have the reputation. People will pay more for your services. I have talked with a couple lawyers. There is a bit of a formula you can kind of use too. Um, you know, obviously you're going to consider that. You'll work about 2,000 hours in a year. Uh, you know, if you take vacation, it might vary some, but generally speaking, 2,000 hours. If you're in a small practice, solo practice, and if you bill five hours a day, you are billing a lot. Um, you will be very, very busy if you're doing that. Um, so 60%. So then, you know, in figuring your overhead costs, and you can just work it backward then. What you need is an hourly rate uh, to to live and the kind of living that you want to have. So you can't even to kind of take the math approach to. And as you start out and develop a client base, 
I want to talk a little bit about keeping clients. And it's easy and it's complicated, I think, at the same time. It's easy in that basically they have to trust you and simply know that you care. I think if they feel that you're working for them and you care about them, you will keep clients. Even if it maybe wasn't the best job you've ever done for a client, as long as they know that you care and you're pulling for them, that really is three-fourths of the battle. It's a personal relationship that you want to have with them. Um, I think they'll stick with you. You know, yes? I just have a question on how many just stand on myself. You say maybe really about five hours a day and you're kind of a lot. You are. I know. That sounds like not a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. And I don't know how to tell you except that like in a small practice like mine, um, if I build five hours in a day, I have really built a lot because there's so many other things that you need to do so many things you can't bill for. Um, and if you can do more, that's great. I think in a big firm, it's easier to bill more because you are in your office and you're doing one thing, and that's working on client files all day. It, it is a little bit more difficult when you're everything to that office. You know, you're the, you're the manager, you're the personnel manager, you're the maintenance person probably. It, I don't know how to say it, but if, other than if you're doing five hours a day, you're doing well. And I think that's a rule of thumb that you'll hear for small practices. You know, 60% of your time. Good threshold to shoot for. Um, maybe some people do better. I just find that more than that really is challenging. Um, so, but to kind of circle back to keeping the client, I guess my number one piece of advice is when they're talking, listen to them. Um, you know, and I have kind of two different schools of training personally. I do have the mental health background where I did a lot of you know, individual therapy and like family therapy and we're really trained to listen uh, to what people say and to affirm what they're saying. One of the great benefits that you all are probably better at than you recognize is when you're listening, you're already thinking about, okay, what's at the heart of this? What is the basic point that they're trying to get at? And you know, the holding of the case, right? I mean, you want to get right to the essence of it. Law school trains you really, really well to do that. And, you know, maybe if I see any of you someday practicing, you'll have to tell me, but I will be listening to a client for the first time, and three minutes into it, I've gotten to that point, and I know what we need to do, and we wouldn't need to talk about it for more than three minutes, but it is so important for that client to be heard, to talk about what they think about it, how they feel about it. Um, and I guess I'm just advising you, listen to them, listen to that, acknowledge what they're saying. You will get to know more about them. They will feel that you, and rightfully so, that you care about them and that you're going to be their advocate. Um, so even though you're highly trained to cut right to the chase, sometimes your clients are going to take a little longer. I think it's okay to let them do that. Um, the number one complaint that I remember looking at uh, when they, every year, when the bar summarizes complaints that they receive, the disciplinary committee, is usually attorneys not returning phone calls, non-communication. Um, and so that goes right against keeping clients like we're talking about, right? So <coughs> know that it's really bad if you don't, and it's really good if you do. Um, I Everybody's going to work out their own system, but keep track of phone calls coming in so you don't lose them and you don't have somebody calling the bar saying, yeah, I called three weeks ago and then I called two weeks ago. I've never heard from that person because then you're explaining what happened. Um, my personal system is I get an email for every call and as soon as I call that person back, whether I have to leave a message or I talk to them and there's a course of action to take, then I email that back to the receptionist and then she keeps all that so that we kind of have an ongoing log. And at the end of the day, she sends me a summary. If she hasn't heard back from anybody, she says, okay, you still haven't called, and then she'll list them one, two, and three. And then I can make those phone calls. And then I let her know when I make them. So I use a buddy system kind of in my office to help have somebody help kind of keep me on track. You'll find something that works for you, but find a system and document it. The other thing that my office does, I just have a, a form that we developed Really simple. When somebody calls in, we write down their name, the time they called, who they called for. Um, so we have a, a record of in, indefinitely of calls that have come into our office and 
in the disposition so that we can keep track. Keep your emails with clients. Um, it, just hit print and it, you know, put it in your outbox and have it filed. You've got a record. Uh, if you need to make a note, make a note on it. Or, you know, if you have contact with a client walking down the street and you actually talk some business, when you get back to the office, I know these things are easier said than done, but make a note. Keep track of it. Um, like my case, my software for the office that I was telling you about uh, is integrated enough. I can just hit a little thing that says note, pull the client name down, and boom, it, it's uh, in the cloud. And then if I want, I can print it, and it's in the, in the hard file. Train your staff to do the same. Train them to document the contacts they have with the public, with your clients, and teach them how you want them to do that. And probably have to monitor it a little bit because like all of us, it's easy to let that slide a little bit. But that'll cut down on you probably being in the position of having a complaint that you haven't stayed in contact with your client. Plus, you know, kind of the same theme with the engagement letters. Um, there's no dispute over what was said if you've documented what you've done. And there can't be any revision of history, you know, from your clients. Um, I think this one's really hard, but I still think it's good advice. And that's send updates to your clients, whether it's, you know, an email update, a letter. You're going to find that practicing law is a reactive sort of profession as opposed to proactive in some ways. You're going to spend your day returning phone calls, getting deadline, you know, meeting deadlines. And you're not going to feel like you have a lot of time to sit there and think, well, I haven't talked to Mr. Johnson for a couple weeks. I should just call him for hi and update him. Um, that is really hard to do. But to the extent that you can, try to do it. And, you know, somebody like me standing up here reminding you is helpful, and it's helpful for me too. And, again, in terms of we're still talking about keeping clients, especially in small towns. I think this applies more to small towns than if you have a corporate practice in Sioux Falls. I think your corporate clients expect they're just going to get big, hefty bills. They just pay them. When you have, you know, a 78-year-old lady come in and you're, she's maybe helping, having you help deed her house to her kids, um, that bill's really important to her, and it might only be $100, but she's going to notice it. So just be careful how you bill. Um, you know, as good Midwesterners, I think we all have a sense of what's right and wrong in terms of consumers and bills that we receive. So just be sensitive to liberal charging. Um, maybe you talk to them on the phone, have a phone contact, and maybe you don't actually bill them for it once in a while, uh, especially if it's quick and they're checking in, and it doesn't cause you to have to do anything with the file. They actually notice that, and they appreciate that. Um, just something you can do. And then, in terms of keeping clients, again, it's about the relationship and the trust. You know, in that conversation, when you know what the issue is three minutes in, but they have the need to kind of explain everything to you, ask them questions. Um, and not just about a client, but just as a person, you know. Make it personal. Kids, spouses, vacations, hobbies, job, whatever. Find common ground. Connect with them. And you will keep your clients. They will be really, really loyal to you, which I think is one of the more rewarding things of a small town practice. Um, I really, really actually enjoy that. That's very rewarding for me. I want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons to being self-employed. Again, of course, I'm thinking small, firm, solo. We'll start out with the negative first. We can end on a positive note. We'll start with the cons. The first is, honestly, the hours can be long. Um, it's just the truth. You know, the buck stops with you. You're the boss. You're the ultimate. You have the ultimate responsibility. And there are just going to be some things that only you can and or should do in the office. And so it just takes time. Um, I've been in practice now, I guess, for 13 years. I'm still the only one that writes checks in my office. I just, uh, as much as I would love to turn it over, when I write every single check, I know exactly what goes out of the office and, you know, how it's doing financially and where the money's being spent. And it helps me be a better steward of the firm's resources. And if there's any question about uh, whether the money should be there or not, it's my responsibility and I'm not wondering about anybody else. 
So you honestly and legitimately can expect to spend evenings, not all of them, but a few, and weekends in the office. Um, your caseload, you know, a con to me is your caseload isn't completely manageable. In fact, we were just talking about the ebb and flow of your caseload. It just is going to happen. You're going to have some periods maybe where you feel like it's down a little bit, but more likely you're just going to have periods where you feel slightly overwhelmed. Um, so I at first felt really guilty when I had some like little lulls. I thought, oh my goodness, are people, you know, not coming to me? And now I just, if I get those, I just really enjoy those. So take them when you can get them because you'll notice that it'll be a little wave, but it'll be kind of an upward uh, climb the longer that you do it. And just expect that. But that's okay. Um, nothing is guaranteed. I think that's a con to being self-employed as an attorney. You know, the expression, you eat what you kill. Um, you have to get the work. You have to do the work. And then you have to collect for the work. And at the end of the month, you have to start all over and do it again. It can be a bit of a grind. Um, you're not guaranteed that income. That's why I talked about if, you know, you're interested in, like, for example, being a state's attorney or a deputy state's attorney, do that. Um, give you some income stability. And, of course, it can be really scary working in a vacuum. For me personally, the scariest thing going out of my own was, who do I talk to about how to do things? You know, I have questions. How do I know for sure what, you know, what pleading do I need? What motion should I make? Uh, Am I forgetting something that I'm going to be, you know, committing malpractice? Well, to help offset that, well, first of all, the fear is a good thing. The fear motivates you. Motivates you to look in the code, do the online research, you know, be diligent. And that's where your mentors and your networking come into play. So you can call people up and say, have you done this? How do I do this? What do I need to know? So I think that's great. Um, and then you're everything to this business, and I had alluded to this briefly before. You know, you're the, you're the building maintenance person. I, I have kind of a tall ceiling, and so over the noon hour, I'm up on ladders changing light bulbs sometimes. Um, you know, you're the finance person, keeping track of the overhead. If you don't farm it out, you're doing the snow and the law, and removal and lawn care. Um, personnel manager. I think that's an area that, in general, as lawyers, we could probably all be better at because we really don't get that training. Um, so that's, I think, a constant struggle. Um, and then another kind of con, I think, I put it in this category. The busier you get as your practice grows and people know who you are and you develop that client base, the less time you have to be available to spend on your individual cases. And to me, that is such a balancing act. You may not be thorough enough in the research that you do or spend as much time with the client, you know, to learn from them, um, scrambling to meet deadlines. I will really apologize. I, the presentation part, you know, the outline and the, the PowerPoint, um, I, I, that's kind of an example. It's just um, your time it just has a lot more demands on it. And that, you know, you have to learn how to manage that. So those are some of the big cons, I think, that you can look at. I'm going to tell you, I think the pros outweigh the cons, and we're going to talk about those. To me, I'm, you know, some of this is opinion, but you're self-employed. To me, that's a big plus. That was really, really the position that I wanted to be in. Um, you're recession-proof. You're not going to get let go during a, you know, a downturn in the economy because you're self-employed. I think that's fantastic. You have autonomy. I mean, you have lots of deadlines, you have lots of people placing demands on you, but at the same time, you have autonomy to do your work how you want to do it and within reason when you want to do it. That's a huge bonus to me. Um, I put in lots of evenings and weekends, and I accept that I do that, but I can also make up for it when I want to. And I'm just telling you all, this time tomorrow, I will be out in some trees hunting turkeys and I will not be wearing a suit and tie. It's just I get to do it, um, and I really like it. I think another really big benefit is it's all yours. You know, you get out of it what you put into it. Your success or lack of really is yours, and you know that you did it. If you're successful, you have the satisfaction of knowing that uh, it's because of your efforts and your work 
your diligence. And if you're not, I mean, you don't have anybody to blame but yourself. I really enjoy that and the satisfaction that you get out of that. You know, because every at the end of every day, you can assess how you've done the every, every month and every year. And uh, it there's a lot of reward in terms of helping people and uh, the autonomy that you have in terms of the way you go about doing that. So I do think that's a big plus. You get to contribute to the local economy. I'm not saying you're going to go to bed every night thinking about that. But it's kind of nice, actually. You belong to the Chamber of Commerce. You employ some people. Uh, you know, you're able to provide a service to the community. I actually think that's really great. And another huge thing to me, small firm, solo practice, is fantastic training just in the legal profession in general. Um, and if you ever decide to go to a big firm, you're going to have a lot to offer them. Um, you know, you're going to know at least a little bit about everything. You know, that jack of all trades, I don't really like that expression. But you're going to know something about a lot of different areas of the law. You are going to be a better uh, guest at a cocktail party than somebody who only does appellate work from Woods Fuller. And I'm not insulting them at all, but, you know, their uh, range of knowledge just is going to be a lot narrower than what you'll know. And people will ask you questions, and you will be able to answer those questions. You know, contract disputes, family law, uh, because you'll have done it all at some point. You're going to know how to be a business person. You're going to know how to be a little bit of an entrepreneur, a manager, a marketer, a salesperson, an accountant, and obviously, of course, a lawyer. But there's going to be a lot more that goes with it. And if you're like me, you'll enjoy learning those things, trying to master them. Um, and again, I just think you'll have a lot of satisfaction that, you know, it's you doing those things. Also, you know, a small firm lawyer, if you want it, you're going to have lots and lots of courtroom experience. Um, you know, they call it circuit court for a reason, and that's because you're going to find, especially if you're in a small town, you know, I'll be in... In any given week, I can be in probably not five counties, but three and four are not uncommon uh, in the circuit. And, you know, you'll see the same judges and the same lawyers there, and uh, you'll get a lot of courtroom experience, especially if you do criminal and or family law. Um, I've been practicing 13 years. I don't know exactly how many jury trials I've had, but when I was at about the year 10 mark, I, I had about 40. Well, I had north of 40. That's kind of when I lost track. About 20 of them or a little bit more I defended, and about 20 or a little bit more I prosecuted. So I had a really balanced experience. And if I went to some big firm, I just know I wouldn't have that type of experience. You know, I prosecuted murder cases, and I've defended aggravated assaults. Um, just really, to me, valuable experience. And then in terms of the court trials that you have, I, I honestly, I couldn't give you a number, but... Lots and lots of courtroom experience that you'll get right away. You're just going to jump in. You're going to do it. And so if that is important to you, that's just a really good way to get it, to be in a small, small practice. Um, you know, and, and as I said, you get to do a little bit of everything right away. Um, I'd been out of law school about three years, so I actually didn't know anybody here because I just turned over. But I got to argue in front of the Supreme Court when it had its spring term here. That was a lot of fun, coming back to the law school and getting to do that. Um, you know, professor still remembered me, obviously. And But if I'd been in a big firm, I'd still been in a back room somewhere, I don't know, learning how to draft contracts. I wouldn't have been arguing in front of the Supreme Court. That would have been a senior partner doing that, probably. So just really good experience that way, I think. And if you want the courtroom experience, I don't know if there's a better way to get it. And then finally... I want to talk to you about if you're a small firm lawyer, how do you define success? And how do you feel good at the end of the day about what you're doing? Um, you know, is it through the amount of money that you earn in a year, number of clients you have, number of cases you've won? Uh, everybody will make up their own mind about that. For me, really, it's uh, the relationships that I develop with my clients, knowing that they trust me that they come back to me, and that uh, you're viewed as part of the community, 
and a person who can help people in that community. Now, you're not going to probably earn the kind of money that, uh, you know, you, you just can't bill $500 an hour in Millbank. It's just not possible. Um, if you go to Minneapolis and work downtown, you can bill $500 an hour. But, you know, don't uh, be discouraged. You can earn a very nice living in a small town as well. Um, you can, especially if you want to work the weekends and evenings to put the time in, you can, you can earn money. Um, but the rewards, I really think, are to be part of the community and uh, know that people appreciate what you do for them. Pretty much my thoughts that I had for you today. How long do we go? Okay. So I'm a bit short. So you guys can bail me out by asking questions. Yes. No. Um, in fact, we were just talking a little bit about that. Um, it's been really helpful for me to have the, the social work and the mental health background because um, it is amazing, you know, how much sort of counseling that you end up doing, especially depending on the kind of work that you do, um, family law, criminal law. I really, really appreciate the fact that I have the background that I do, and I use it every day in some way. So it was an easy transition for me, and I was really glad to have that background. Yes. So it's talked about a lot that you kind of earn a good living as a small town attorney or as an attorney in general, but I always feel like that's one of the things that our presenters or just other attorneys you talk to never actually give you an idea of what <laughs> that means. And now that I'm asking you, yeah. how do you go about finding that out and feeling comfortable with that number and then communicate not only with your clients, but obviously your loved ones are going to be curious. Yeah. And, you know, how do you just kind of manage that? Well, in terms of expect, yes. So the question generally was, there's a lot of talk about you can earn a comfortable living, but more specifically, maybe what does that mean and how do you kind of conceptualize that? Um, small town lawyers, particularly, or small firm lawyers, maybe more specifically, um, earn the gamut from probably barely making it to several hundred thousand dollars a year annually. And so I don't think anybody's dodging the question. I just think it's really difficult to answer. Um, you know, it depends a lot. Do you do contingency work, you know, where you're getting a percentage of, like, personal injury recovery? If you're, I mean, if you bill $175 an hour and you know that you're going to bill X number of hours a month, you can kind of extrapolate and get an idea that way. Um, but it's... It's really hard to tell you. I mean, even in Millbank, I can tell you that I'm pretty sure that there's probably a six-figure spread between the highest earner and the lowest earner. Um, and again, some of that's what do you want to put into it. So I know that's a bad answer, but um, I will just say the potential's there. You know, you just have to get it. So as a follow-up, when you go to a small town, I mean, how do you kind of figure out where you should be? Because I think that might be one of the hardest things is figuring out what you're worth as you know, being young, you probably want to undervalue yourself slightly. So I mean, how do you do that while also kind of managing your expectations? Like hourly rate you're talking? Yeah. So how do you determine starting out what your hourly rate might be? Because I, I imagine some of your competitors are going to want to tell you maybe what they make. Well, I think there's rules about um, making sure you don't price fix with other lawyers. But, um, it, you know, it's amazing. You'll be made aware of what other people are charging. Um, whether it is an offhand discussion with another attorney or a client is talking. Um, again, I can't say that I know it for a fact, but I'm guessing that, like for example, in Millbank, everybody's probably within 15 to 20 dollars an hour from each other in terms of their hourly rate. Um, yeah, specifically, I guess I couldn't tell you exactly. It's just I can tell you that that information is out there, and you'll run across it. Yes, sir. Um, with uh, referring to other attorneys, uh, are there some risks that come with that? And what I'm getting at is, uh, say, for instance, you refer to another attorney, a particular client, and that attorney winds up like missing a filing deadline. Uh, 
could that attorney be held responsible for making a referral in the first place? So the question is, are there risks in referring clients to other attorneys, for example, if the subsequent attorney misses a filing fee or a statute of limitations? Um, before I came down here for this class, I just stopped upstairs and I talked to Dean Vickery. We talked exactly about that, which is so funny. Um, and he's basically saying, you know, if you have like a disengagement letter, I'm not going to represent you, but I'm referring you to so-and-so. Um, put in there that, you know, some general broad language, you should probably see that other person immediately. And uh, Professor Vickery's specific advice was don't put in there like, okay, the statute of limitations is three years. Because what if you get it wrong? <laughs> so don't say that. Just say, go see them immediately. Um, and in writing, so that you're covered. And if they had any trouble doing that, they can get into contact with you. But I think that's where that uh, non-engagement letter comes into importance and will protect you referring them to somebody else. Because I really think once they get to that next lawyer, they take on the duty and responsibility to make their assessment, whether there's a statute of limitations issue or, you know, get a complaint answered within 30 days or, or whatever. So I think cover yourself in writing to your client or non-client. Yes, sir. So I'm sure when you started your own firm, there was a lot of people had a solo firm and they were able to move on and whatever. But like, how long did it take you to get it from that point A until you feel very confident in the same <laughs> Okay, when you start out, the question is basically when you start out and you're probably motivated a lot, insecurity and maybe fear of not knowing what you're doing, how long does it take to get a sense of being more comfortable and confident in your abilities? I'm guessing that's a very individual thing. I, will, I can share my own experience with you. Um, so I was admitted into the bar September of 2003. I went on my own in the September of 2006. Just me personally and my comfort level, I really didn't feel like I could have gone on my own sooner because um, I really felt like I would have been scratching my head too much. And, and just from a comfort level standpoint, my anxiety would have been too high. Um, and then I recollect that probably for two, three years, my anxiety was also just higher just because I was kind of doing everything for the first time. And, but that slowly fades away, and then one day you just realize, hey, wait a minute, I you know, kind of know what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, like I said, that shouldn't stop anybody from doing that if that's what they want to do, because you'll get so much help from other people if you go about it the right way. You just really will. Um, you know, I, I tried not to go to the well too many times, of course, but I was not afraid to ask questions and seek help and it's there. I mean, this is a great bar and community for that. So, and I'm guessing even your professors get calls once in a while and say they'll answer questions for you. So, it actually took me a few years. I think that's a personal, you know, what's your risk level, you know, tolerance. And you get through it, I think, no matter what. Yes, sir. How do you manage knowing when to call people for help and then how often to call. Because I mentioned some point time you might feel like you're overloading some of the questions. Yeah. And how do you go about kind of spreading the questions? So the question is, you know, how do you know when to call to ask for help and so that you don't overuse somebody or how do you kind of spread that out? Um, well, for me, if, if I really felt like looking in the code and at the case law, didn't get it done for me, then I thought I better ask somebody. Um, if I thought I could make a mistake that would hurt my client, that was sort of my indicator that I needed to reach out to somebody. Um, and then who to call? You know, I had a handful of colleagues that uh, I knew were very comfortable and if I had called one last time, I might pick another one the next time. Or it might depend on the subject area too, you know, and their level of expertise. Um, like I said, just even graduating from this school, you'll already know so many people that I don't think that'll be a problem for you. Uh, you'll probably end up calling some of the people that are in this room now at various firms. And 
you know, and I don't talk to just other small firm lawyers either. I mean, you know, one of my classmates, you know, for example, works at Woods Fuller, and he's got all sorts of resources to help if, you know, and he's willing to help too. So I just don't think you're going to find a problem that way. Anybody else? Thank you so much, Dad.